Hey everybody, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. Hope everybody is doing well. We're so excited to see you and look who is here live and direct, not from Sedona, Arizona. Today he's on location from beautiful Glendale, California. Our friend, television actor, singer, producer, and so much more. Played Alex on One Day at a Time, Norma Lear's wonderful creation. It is Glenn Scarpelli back on the Gym Master Show Live. There he is. Hey, Glenn. Good to see you. Welcome, hey. my friend. Oh, It's always great to be back with uh, all of you folks here at the Gym Master Show. Um, Levity Hall is one of my favorite spots to visit. So thanks for having me back, man. Oh, this is really great. We've been really looking forward to it. And we mentioned that we would keep that porch light on for you the last time you were here <laughs> on the series and we were chatting. Hey, let's come back, update our viewers on some of the cool things you're working on and how you've gotten through, you know, this crazy pandemic and everything. And uh, how have you been, my friend? Uh, you look great. I love the background there in Glendale. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm doing really well. I met my boyfriend Johnny's house, John Ritchie Jr. This is his place, so I can't take I can't take a whole lot of credit for the background, but I do think this wall is pretty awesome. So I thought I'd share it with all of you guys today. John is a um, game show producer. You know, he's yes. one of the producers on Hundred Thousand Dollar Pyramid with Michael Strahan on ABC. They're just about to go into production for their next season, so we're very excited about that. The show moved out here to LA. Yes. So he doesn't have to come to New York to shoot that anymore. So I'm um, hopefully, you know, we, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to visit because the, you know, with the whole COVID thing, they're still pretty hunkered down at the studios, but I hope I get a chance to at least get a, a guest pass to mm. go see the show. So I don't know. We'll see, but that's where I'm coming to you from today. Nice, nice. But normally you're in beautiful Sedona, right? Tell us for the uh, viewers watching who've never been to Sedona, what a, you know, gorgeous, heavenly place Sedona, Arizona really is. You picked a great spot to land, my friend. Yes, indeed. And I, I got to tell you, I moved out there originally in 92. I, I came back, you know, back and forth to Los Angeles a little bit in the 90s. So I was, I've basically been there 28 years um, total. And I just love my life in Sedona. You know, it's, it's one of those places, Jim, that really is a wonderful energy to center um, it's a healthy lifestyle. It's got a wonderful um, community consciousness. You know, it's not a big town. There's only 10,000 of us that live in that town. Like That's four, it. Yeah, but 4 million people come, come through our town oh, to visit yes. every year. So we certainly have our, our share of visitors and we welcome folks and love to open those doors and share the beauty with everybody. Mm, that is really, really fantastic. And, you know, it's really cool because since we chatted last, you're doing some really fantastic things, uh, hosting and producing a uh, travel series. It's on several of the uh, affiliated stations. Tell us about that uh, breaking news here on the show. That's cool. Congratulations on that. Uh, thank you so much, my friend. Um, yeah. So, you know, originally about four years ago, I, um, I started doing these Friday segments on Sonoran Living, which is a morning show on ABC 15 in Phoenix. And they just went so well that now we're syndicated to other markets around the country. So like this Friday, I think I'm on in Tucson, San Diego, Las Vegas, Denver, back in Phoenix wow. again. And um, I'm just so happy to, you know, to share all the wonderful things to see and do in Arizona. Eventually, we won't just be doing Arizona. We, we hopefully will be doing some segments out in Hawaii and in California and so on and so forth in Utah. But right now we're promoting areas in Arizona and um, it's just it's just so much fun. And I I'm, I'm just feel so blessed to be able to do this. And a little bit when we were sharing while we were doing our tech rehearsal for this right before we went on the air. I was sharing with you that, you know, I basically shoot the segments on location. If it's at a, you know, a wildlife park, I'm there visiting the animals or I'm going zip lining or I'm going kayaking down a river. And like, we actually take you to the location that we're promoting. Mm. But um, when I actually do these, like what we call throw to the package on the air, I'm sitting in my home or in Johnny's home in some cases like today, where I um, have a green screen set up and I'm talking to hosts all over the country. And I, you know, they'll be like, Glenn, where are you taking us today? I said, well, today we're taking you right outside of Sedona and, you know, whatever the segment may be. So technology is amazing. 
the pandemic was really um, miraculous in the way that people accept this type of show now and this mm -hmm. type of interview. It's, 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 um, you know, uh, normalized, if you will. Yes, right. So, so the fact that I can even be in these five cities in one day by sitting in my living room is, <laughs> it's pretty miraculous. It really is. You know, it's just the technology and the way it has all just taken off, especially during the pandemic. How, mm -hmm. You know, I keep saying during the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, I hope that everybody is more empathetic and kinder and coming together and that we sort of rise from the ashes of it all more empathetic. H how have things been with you and the family, everybody well, everybody getting through, got through it all? Yeah. I mean, lots of big changes, uh, I think, for so many people. I mean, yeah. for us as a society, of course, um, for our country as a country and for um, each um, each one of us individually. But I, you know, I definitely went through a lot of changes um, since the last time I saw you. One of the things that had occurred for me, and this was kind of right before the pandemic, honestly, Jim. So the pandemic was an opportunity to actually figure some of this stuff out. But I found myself at the age of 53, hitting a wall with some unprocessed emotions from my younger days. Uh, I think I've shared with you that my first husband, Gary, passed away at the age of 36. I was 25. He died of HIV AIDS. And at 53 years old, I found myself um, experiencing some PTSD from it. There were some triggers that occurred in my life. And I needed to deal with unprocessed grief. You mm. know, grief is an, grief is an interesting um, experience for all of us. Yes, it it's is. Something, it's something that none of us can avoid. Because the one only guarantee in life is that we all go at some point. Mm -hmm. And not only do we go, but we watch the, our, the ones we love go. And um, at 25 years old, I just didn't have the emotional skill set to deal with all of it. Mm. You know, I, I certainly um, put it down and pushed it aside. I, one of the things that, I, that happens for me is one of my coping mechanisms, if you will, is busyness. Yes. So I stay, you know, it's easy. To, and I know you do the, your workaholic too. Hello. I mean, <laughs> I like I'm constantly working. It's just so much easier than dealing, you know? So um, that had been a, you know, a, a definite mechanism for me to, um, I, I want to say avoid, but really it's, it's not, it's not like this intentional avoidance. It's um, a coping mechanism for pain. It's, mm. it's a way to cope with our pain. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, you know, at 53 years old, I'm, I'm 55 now, I really, too, this was two years ago, I really just had to, like, hunker down and, and, like, untangle some of those wires, some of those emotional wires for myself. And this happened really towards the end, shortly after I did your show. It was all your show's fault, basically. basically. You know, you just, <laughs> you, you sent me in a, in, a, in a tailspin. I don't understand. No, I'm kidding. You sent you to um, Lovely Land. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dig deeper, Dig deeper. Dig deeper. <laughs> Let it rise to the surface. Yeah. Yes. But it did, you know, and it was something that um, I'm such a better person for today. Yeah. I feel yeah. so, I feel um, more content. I feel more centered. Um, I've healed parts of myself that needed healing. But this is one of those things about grief. You know, I worked with a grief specialist, a trauma specialist that was incredible. Um, when I was actually going through the, um, original symptoms of this i was uh having trouble sleeping and i was up at like 3 30 in the morning and i was on the floor of my bathroom praying god please what is happening to me i don't feel like i want myself back where did i go what is going on why do i feel like this why do i have such sadness and fear and grief and what am i feeling why am i feeling all this anguish right now i thought i i thought i did this and really all i could hear from the universe was Call Mackenzie, call Mackenzie, call Mackenzie. And that's what I did. You know, I, I waited till about 7 a.m. And I was like, okay, she must be up by now. And, and I called her and I said, I'm going through this stuff. Like, what is going on? All I could hear is call you. <laughs> so what's going on? And, you know, because she works at and with the Breathe Life Healing Center in beautiful West Hollywood, California, right here, she has at her fingertips all the um, necessary tools mm -hmm. to heal pain. 
because that's really what addiction is all about. You know, yeah. it's all the, the numbing of the pain and the unprocessed feelings that, you know, you got to feel it to heal it, they say, right? Yikes. Um, yikes is right, because that's yeah. not easy for yeah. any of us. No one right. wants to go through that, but it's a narrow passage. But once you go through it and you get through it and you just breathe through it and actually feel it, you do come out the other side. And um, so she sent me up with, you know, some of the incredible, brilliant minds, one being um, Kathleen Murphy, who I worked with, who I, I highly, I, I just go, oh, my gosh, mm -hmm. Kathleen, just, you know, she saved my life. Mm. And, and um, I did a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. I did a retreat, actually, um, on a ranch doing some equine therapy, too, which was fantastic. Um, but really, a lot of just digging deep and slowing down and finally feeling it to heal it. So I'm through that, but it changed right. my life. It but changed it changed life. your life in so many ways. So what were some of the, the residual effects of it as far as changing your life? Do you see with more focus and clarity now? Are you more willing to receive from the world? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Both of those. You know, I look at my life and I feel like I'm calmer. Mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm able to accept balance. Balance has always been a challenge for me because like I said, keeping busy has been a mechanism, um, a safety mechanism for myself. Yeah. But um, I'm able to take time and be quiet and know that what I'm feeling is safe. You mm -hmm. know, I feel, I feel safe in the quiet times now. Um, whereas maybe before this, I, I hadn't, um, I just keep, kept creating a lot of hubbub to avoid. Um, so that is certainly amazing. I, I've learned a new level of compassion, Jim. And honestly, I do these um, practices of compassion on a daily basis because you really can't be compassionate to the world until we really know self-compassion. So I literally at times when I'm going through you know, whatever we all feel sometimes, fear or anger or anguish or frustration. And I mean, there's so much of that in the world. Mm -hmm. We just look around and it's so easy to get caught up in everywhere. All, yeah. Yeah. All the emotions that can occur due to circumstances, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so what I, what I realized was when I feel that I was always so hard on myself, mm -hmm. I was always so like, no, but I'm the happy guy. I'm the spiritual guy. I'm the guy that, you know, I got that together. I'll make your that. world better. Put your troubles on my shoulders. I'll make it better for you. Yeah. Yes, the caretaker mm -hmm. and the one trying to uplift and you know all that. I know how that, that is. <laughs> I know you do. I know this is why we are kindred spirits, my friend. I think it's something um, to do with growing up on an island. You were statin and I was long. That's right. <laughs> it's got to be an that's island right. sort of thing. <laughs> it's island fever, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. But, but you know what it, what it really came down to was um, it's the human condition. Yes. And this is. Is, this is where I started to, and that was the real breakthrough for me. The first real breakthrough was to allow myself these feelings and to not feel guilty or shame over the fact that I don't have my crap together emotionally and that this is what we all go through. This is the human condition. So I would literally hold myself and just gently do this and just say, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay that I feel this way. It's okay. If I'm scared, it's okay. If I'm sad, it's right. okay. If I'm angry, it's okay. Like to give myself permission to feel right. is a big deal. Like we have to actually give ourselves permission and to mm -hmm. be, so compassionate to ourselves knowing that it's a hard world this is not easy we don't have to go through this joyful joy is an option and certainly one that is available but we also have all these other things that make us who we are as human beings and that was the real clincher for me like that was the big light bulb moment was to allow myself to feel that so now I feel this deeper level of compassion. I, I, I really relate to the Buddhist philosophy a lot yes. with <laughs> compassion because I didn't, you know, and, you know, you understand the, uh, an idea of compassion or even the idea of PTSD. Like I understood what it was intellectually, but until you emotionally experience something, it becomes a whole nother story, you know? Yes. 
So I think the compassion thing for me was, I feel so much more compassion for others because I allow this for myself. I mean, it's really true. Like there is a sense of you can't be compassionate to another until you're compassionate to yourself. You can't love someone until you love yourself. I mean, these are, this is not just, you know, jive. This mm -hmm. is the real, this is, this is real. Right. And with, with compassion, I look at people, you know, like sometimes if someone cuts me off on the road or, you know, says something to me nasty in the street or, you know, what, whatever was going down during the pandemic with the, with the masks, without the masks, whatever side everybody was on, there was always that angst. Um, I just found so much more compassion in how I approached all of that because I said, you know, as I was doing therapy to relieve myself from my wounds, we all have wounds. There's no one on this planet that goes unwounded. It's just not the way the human condition is. So I just had so much more compassion knowing I, um, I can only imagine the pain that that person has experienced because I'm finally dealing with my own. And hurt people hurt people, you know? So Do you think any of this um, added to why you liked being an actor you were able to take on other roles and maybe sort of push down your own feelings i know a lot of people who say that uh one of the things that they love about acting is that they don't have to deal with themselves they can always mm. be somebody else and sort of live life through the characters did any of that come into play for you over the years did taking on you know, characters or having that veil allow you to maybe not deal with who Glenn Scarpelli himself was until later on. Now you're doing these other things where Glenn is Glenn. Glenn is not Alex or, or anybody mm -hmm. else. Glenn is not the, you know, the singer, the pop star. He's Glenn. And you're coming in touch, looking in the mirror and saying, okay, you know, I've always been this, this, this for the world but who's Glenn? Let me figure out who Glenn is. I've been what the world has wanted me to be. And fortunately they've loved it. But now let me look at and investigate who I am. Would you say that's some of the, some of the story, my friend? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're hitting it right on the head, you know? And, and I think that um, for me, you know, acting was therapy, you know, because one of the things you, you play other characters, yes, and there's a chance to hide behind that to an extent, but you still have to bring yourself to the table. So with acting, and maybe that's why I was attracted to it at so, such a young age, I really do know my passion is to find, to discover more about myself, you know, on my Instagram page, it says, explain who you are. And I, I write, you know, a seeker of self-awareness because that's always been my jam. Like, what is my next level? What can I scratch away and learn more about myself? How can I make this lifetime one in which I evolve and grow to the best of my ability? So the whole acting art of acting, I don't even call it profession, I call it the art of acting, is really about being so in touch with your emotional being, being in touch to pull from this, pull from that, and apply it to, you know, a different, another character. Um, but again, here I am at 53 and you're right. I am looking at myself in the mirror and certainly saying, okay, how much of that did I hide behind? And now I'm just ready to find out who, who I am and what makes me happy. And you know, Jim, I got to tell you, I went through a lot of, I down a lot of paths as I was really processing my life during this, this whole time, you know, really looking at everything in my life, my childhood and then everything since. Yeah. Right. And you, we go through a lot of what we don't want to find mm. out what we want. Yes. You know? It's a journey, isn't it? It's a journey. And it's, it's, and it's an important part of the journey. Like, like, and we have to forgive ourselves and be compassionate to ourselves to know that we went down that road thinking that's who we were. But, you know, it turned out maybe it wasn't. You know, I've been in relationships where, I mean, I was in a different relationship the last time I spoke to you. And as much as I was sad, that that ended, I tried everything I could to make that work. But really what the bottom line was, it didn't fit this person. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the perfect fit for me. And um, I, I, you know, I, I, he's such a wonderful man and I wish him only happiness. 
But for me, it wasn't the, it just wasn't the perfect fit. And I discovered that as time went on, when the world got quiet, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was very much busy, busy. And I knew what was ever was even wrong with that relationship. I was busy enough to where it didn't make that big a deal, but then the world stopped. (laughs) And you had time to process and breathe and reflect and like a lot of people did. And it's been a lot of really did, yeah. an extraordinary thing because, you know, we've all been so busy. And then when everything did pause, the great pause, right. uh, it gave us time to really say, okay, what is next chapter for me? What do I want to do right. next? How do I want to inspire others? How do I want to right. inspire myself and stay plugged in or maybe plug in even deeper to the world. And it sounds like this epiphany, you know, it took all this time, but there's a reason for everything. I drove, I think I mentioned this maybe the last time I had something similar happen when I was on a television shoot and it was for a news program we do in New York news magazine show. And I was sent out to Las Vegas and I was out in Pahrump, Nevada, an hour Mm -hmm. West of uh, Vegas, really familiar with it. Yes. Cool town. And uh, I had the finished the shoot and the crew went back to where they came from. They came from Los Angeles and I still had some time before my plane would uh, fly from Vegas back East. So I took the rental car and I drove around Pahrump, which is a really interesting, funky town. And I love to, you know, go off the beaten path and discover different places and different people and cultures. But every turn I took with that rental car, it kept bringing me to the entrance of death Valley. I have no idea why it was August. <laughs> I was already 110 in Vegas. So you it's know hot what, there. what the Death Valley would be. And it just brought me every turn, kept bringing me to that one sign with that arrow and that road with the humidity bubbling off it and the road that goes on forever, just like in the movies, just like on television. And something pushed me in and I went in. I went in and what I felt, I may have shared this with you or not, but I felt it very strongly. The very first emotion I felt was guilt and it was strong. And the guilt was that I was not sharing this incredible monumental experience of we're in Death Valley and I'm alone in a rental car. Nobody knows I'm doing this. There are no provisions. There's no charged cell phones. The only thing I know about this rental car is the make and model. That's about it. I don't know if it's going to overheat or Mm. break down or what's going to happen with this thing. And it was really, really uncanny because um, this guilt that I had was that I was not sharing the beautiful experience, this monumental experience of Death Valley and all the beautiful, visual, stunning beauty of it, you know, because obviously I'd put it on the pedestal like a Grand Canyon. If you're going to go to Death Valley, you got to go with others and share the joy and and be the one who's facilitating the joy. Be the host. Listen to Mm. everybody else giggling and laughing and taking pictures. And you're the one that's driving the car and taking them with Mm. you. So there were no loved ones or friends in this car. It was just me. So I felt guilt that I didn't have loved ones and friends to share this with. And it was tremendous. And I felt that on other occurrences other times before where I was at really cool, fantastic situations and scenarios where I'm like, gee, it would be so much better if the family and the relatives and the friends and mm. the were here so we can bounce off each other's energy. But there was no opportunity for that to happen. I couldn't get people on planes fast enough to get to Death Valley, <laughs> you know, to come and join me in this rental car. Right. So I was given this option of either turning the car around and coming back one day and doing this again. If you ever knew you were going to do that, who knows if you're going to be in death Valley again. Right. So I had the option of either continuing or turning the car back. Mm -hmm. And I felt these really incredible energies in a very profound way. I felt the pull of the earth. I felt the real strong pull of the earth. Wow. I felt surrounded by mother nature and the pull of mother nature. And then mm-hmm. even a presence of a divine sort of guiding me, not visible, but sort of guiding and saying, you've got an option here. You could keep going with that rental car and see what happens. Who knows? As you go further into Death Valley, anything can happen. It could be an episode of the Twilight Zone or turn the car back, go to the hotel and wait for the plane to leave Vegas tomorrow morning. And I said, you know what? I'm going to keep going. 
Wow. And as the further I went in, uh, it became liberating. The guilt of not having the loved ones and friends in the car to experience it with me uh, sort of lifted. It was like a burden that I imposed on myself. The family never said, the friends never said, your experiences will only be better if we're with you. That's something I put on myself just because I'm very communal and I love friends and family and that whole thing. And so, you know, I always looked at those times as some of the best. So there was none of that and um, drove all the way through, did the whole thing. And it goes on further, but to condense it, people say, well, what did you get out of driving through Death Valley? I said, well, those feelings of those energies, the divine, the mother nature, the raw earth, that I'm on a planet and you can just see the dirt. There it is. There's no city skyline there. My right. Zen place is the ocean. You know, we're here on the East coast. we got the ocean here, the Atlantic. I'm always yeah. in it, swimming, surfing, boogie boarding, sailing. And I love the ocean. So it couldn't be the ocean. Couldn't be the city. Couldn't have been a beautiful forest or a lush garden. It had to be stripped desert for me to mm-hmm. really plug in with that sense of self so it was really amazing. Uh, three things would be similar to what you're talking about. First was the understanding that the world is going to continue to spin on its axis, whether I continue to rescue it all the time. Mm. The second is the oxygen mask that when I'm on an airplane and they say in the event of you know the need of oxygen, the masks will drop in front of you. Mm-hmm. I was always raised, I was always of the ilk that... Um, That's selfish to just grab that mask. No, no, no. Help thy fellow neighbor, that person right next to you. Help them first. And then whatever's left, you can grab for you. Now I understand that in order to help the other person, I have to have the oxygen on me. They have to have the oxygen on them so we can all help each other. That was number two. And uh, the third thing was um, the understanding that there's going to be situations in my world where I'm the only one in the room. Like I was in that rental car driving alone through Mm. August heat in death Valley. And that, um, that that's great. That that is a gift that was given to me. And there will be times where I'm in the room and the only one in the room where that thing is happening, whatever is happening is me. So Mm. don't look away from the gift take the gift. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've driven a car with family in it and we're on the Massachusetts Turnpike going from Boston, you know, towards New York or what have you or Connecticut and I'm the only one who sees the media shower going in front of us. Nobody they they've nodded off, they're sleeping in the back seat and I'm like, hey, "Did you see that?" And they're like, "What? What? What?" I'm like, "Wait a minute. <laughs> you didn't see it? I'm the only one every single right. time. I'm the only one who sees it." So I understand that these are gifts. And uh, I guess there's a fourth thing. And I don't know if you've had to do this as well. I've never really done it effectively or probably tried to do it. And that is create boundaries, Mm. self-preserving boundaries. If somebody has a fire and they need my bucket of water, I'll run over there with the bucket of water. But if I have a flame in front of me, I got to put this flame out first, then I'll grab water and I'll run over to help you with your, your fire. And so creating a sense of boundaries is something that I had to do as well. And I have to tell you, not every single person on the planet is used to that or expects that or liked that because they're used to me always answering the phone at three 30 in the morning or whatever is happening. I'm going to run and jump and pause my world to take care of that. They, a couple of people fell off the face of the earth, but what it did do is it attracted all this other energy, all these other people that are like, we want you at the party. We want to collaborate with you. We want to work with you. We want you here. We want your energy, your vibe. And I'm like, and, and this series might have even grown out of that too. Um, it's just something that it was a result of all of this understanding of uh, self mm-hmm. And one of my friends is David Friedman. I don't know if you ever met him, David, uh, in Norwalk, Connecticut. He's a brilliant composer. Composer. And, yes, wrote the yeah. music for Aladdin and so much more. And I was telling him the story. We were at a function at their house in Connecticut. And I said, uh, let me tell you about this Death Valley story. I call it the Death Valley story. And uh, he said, what happened was you were in touch with self. You were mm. in touch with 
self. It was you, you, and you. And it seems like for you, Glenn, um, that has been what has happened. And it has been a glorious thing for you on so many different levels that I think enhances what you're delivering to the world. Not that anything before wasn't authentic Glenn Scarpelli, but right. now it's the it's the one hundred percent Glenn that everybody's getting and and really liking, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much to digest in that story, my friend. Like, I, I'm just like my head's popping with um, so many uh, uh, coincidences and 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 alignments to what's going on for me, and and like so many things in that story. Um, you did share it with me, but I don't think we got into it quite as deep as we just did. So um, really touched me. You know, I too am very, you know, inspired by nature. One of the reasons I moved to Sedona after living in cities my whole life was that I did get to see the earth that the universe actually created and how it has been formed naturally. So that alone is something that really helps put you just in the moment because it really is something about that moment and what it looks like today, you know? So, so that's, that was a big one. And then something else you said that really, really um, hit home for me, Jim, was thinking the way you would think wasn't necessarily how it was. Like you put that thought in your head, you thought it was better if your family was there or if you could share it, that was part of a box that you put yourself in. And I think that's been so much for me because I too have been the one and, you know, even as a child actor, bringing like all that fun and excitement, even to my family, you know, it's like there was my mom and dad and like it changed their lives. And even though dad had an illustrious career himself, you know, we all really enjoyed what I was doing and I was never forced. I begged to be in it, but there was this part of me that felt this responsibility to maintain this kind of role that I played, um, even when it wasn't necessary. It was never necessary, you know? So, so, so much of what we think our truth is, is just stuff that we put on ourselves, boxes we put on ourselves. And as I've been doing this work, you know, I've really realized that these lenses we look at are just the lens of what our experiences are. It's not true. You know, I think that's why our world is going through a real um, kind of, oh, I don't know, some sort of metamorphosis about mm -hmm. truth. You know, even when you look at the news, like it depends on which news you're watching and which, you know, truth you would be looking at. Right. You know, what it, what is truth, I think, is a big, you know, uh, uh, dilemma these days. <laughs> these yeah. days what is as to what right. that is well i mean i think that's the job of each of us i think where what you're talking about and what i've been sharing is part of what is my truth what is my truth you know there really is only one truth it's not it's not a matter of opinion but yet these our brains get in the way because we think a certain way and because we think it we believe it yes you know so it's it's kind of like we have to um, calm the mind is our, you know, mindfulness, as they say, you know, you have to watch your, your thoughts kind of float by and not mm -hmm. stay attached to the thought because right. we are not our thoughts, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, I just read an incredible book called the, the, Un the untethered soul. Mm, I don't know if you've heard, heard of it by yeah. Yeah, Michael A. Singer. And I just did the audio book because I travel back and forth to Sedona all the time. So I have a chance to listen to a lot of audio books and I highly recommend that one um, because it's a sense of the, the person we are, what is what we truly are, what we what we resonate as our our center, our source is that piece that actually sits behind all that mm -hmm. and and watches that and knows that, you know, in this moment, yeah, I'm born as Glenn and I'm in this body, but this is all going to go. This is not real. This is not forever. This is just my identity today. So when we get really a sense of who we are and we really start healing things within us, we have to start recognizing that other part of us, the quiet, non-thinking, non-judging mm -hmm. aspect of ourselves that is source. 
you know, um, holy source creator, if you will. So it's that quiet part. So I think through all of these experiences we're talking about, we could scratch away at all those things we were thinking, you know, the responsibility of having to take care of everybody, you know, caretaker is a big thing yes. for a lot of, and I think it's an East coast, maybe it isn't a uh, long and Staten kind of thing because I see it a lot, you know, um, I've studied the work of Pia Melody. I don't know if you've ever heard of her or read mm -hmm. her books, but she does a lot about codependency. And codependency is all about boundaries. To heal codependency, it's all about boundaries. And it's all about knowing that I, I can't run my cup empty and run my life. You How know, are you way. able to set boundaries, especially being in the public eye where everybody's always pulling at you and they want more of you and they want you here and there and mm -hmm. they want you to always be on. They want you to always match exactly what their expectation of you is or what they're seeing on the screen or what have you. Have you dealt with all of that? And has that been difficult? Yeah, I mean, I'm still dealing, you know, I, I'm certainly, you know, this is the whole thing is I don't think we ever land anywhere. I think in this lifetime, it's just the journey, you yeah, know, it is, it just keeps going and there's more and more. Um, I mean, I learned that with the work that I did for grief, you know what I mean? It's like, I thought I grieved period. Right. right. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, grief is not something that ends. Grief is something that can pop up 30 years later exactly, and, and be there as if, as if it was yesterday. So yeah. this whole essence of boundaries for me is a work in progress it's i think it's my life's work on this round <laughs> you know i think that um and i have to be careful with it too even on social media because i'm very yes. friendly and yeah. and there are certain people i've connected to that i've never even met a few whose names are running at the bottom of your screen every once in a while by the way so i want to say hi to everybody yes um, yes so I, even with social media though i have to be careful that i just don't keep like you like, save some of you for you. Yeah. My energy, yeah. energy is important yeah. and energy is very, you have to feel safe within that energy, you know? Yes. And that's where I'm talking about balance is something that I've actually been um, getting a lot better at and balance has to do with boundaries. Yes. You know? um, that's a big part of how you, you know, can create balance in your life is to say, no, I can't do that right now. Cause I'm doing this, mm -hmm. you know, and self care became a bigger part of my life. I meditate more. I, um, I certainly have my alone time. I hike with Poco, my dog, um, almost daily, although this is my hiking time. So I gave up my hike for you today, Jim masters, just so you know, um, this is, <laughs> we call that <laughs> lovity. That is lovity. That's, That's lovity. This is so well <laughs> worth it. Cause this is also self care to me because having these conversations, means the world to me. This is what I live for. I mean, really, this is my jam. You know, I me might too. have, I might have like, an, like, you know, a calling for a professional thing. But um, honestly, I, this is, this is what I was put here to do was to just figure my stuff out, you know, to, to recognize what it is that I'm beyond what the eyes could see. Yes. You know, that's right. What this, exactly. What this, what this dimension's all about. So, you know, I love this. I love this kind of talk. Oh, me too. Me too. And, and you and I, even the last time, we just let it roll for the people watching. You know, the way I do this series, um, there's no prescripted questions, there's right. no teleprompter. It's conversational, sort of Cavett, Carson, Regis, Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas style with the uh, modern vibe and modern twisted today. And, and we just bring out and talk about a lot of different things, current mm -hmm. and past. And, you know, it's also, uh, it, it really is, you know, beautiful that we are talking about this and almost uncanny and ironic uh, because this is, a, I know, a very special moving and touching day in your life, mm -hmm. celebrating uh, your dad. Uh. And, uh, yeah. And again, like we're talking about family and the importance of family and um, your dad, you know, separate from being the dad of Glenn Scarpelli, a significant person in the creative arts, you know, with uh, Archie and, and just being a super mm. talented person. For those who only know your dad because of Archie, 
Um, who was your dad to you? Wow. Um, you know, dad was, dad was a character. He was larger than life at times. He had the greatest laugh. I definitely inherited a version of his laugh, <laughs> um, but he was unique all unto himself. That's for yes. sure. He, he had a, an incredible sense of humor. I mean, being a cartoonist was definitely no uh, accident. Like he had the, the personality to be a cartoonist. Yeah, there I am on the cover of Archie. He also got me in the magazine. Um, How cool is that? The comics, yes. They actually, when I was on One Day at a Time, his buddies that run Archie said, "You know, why don't we put Glenn there since he's in all these teen magazines and such?" So yeah. sixteen that was a, Teen Beat, Tiger Beat, <laughs> and then Archie Comics. So that was a, that was a dream come true, and also an opportunity for Dad and I for our worlds to collide. We'd never really worked together before, so that was a really wonderful experience. My dad was. Um, you know, one of my heroes, for sure. Yeah. He was incredible to me throughout my life. You know, I'm an only child. So an only child has a very unique relationship with his parents. Um, my dad, you know, I begged to be an actor from when I was five. I broke them down at about eight. You did. And that's when and that's when I got into the business. They were like, all right, already. Because I was like, because they were like, well, when you're an adult, you can, you know, you'll do that when you're an adult. I'm like, I don't want to wait till then. <laughs> I want to do it right now. So so I finally, I finally you know, wore them down. And the thing that was incredible specifically about my dad, because he was a creative and because he had a creative job, um, he never said get a real job. You know, I know a lot of people friends yeah. of mine that didn't get that kind of support from their parents. So I just want to always acknowledge that I really did get that support um, from both mom and dad, but, you know, yeah. specifically dad who, you know, certainly didn't see acting as unattainable. Right. You know, he, he certainly said, well, I'm the way he saw, you know, cartooning as, you know, I'm going to go out and be a cartoonist. And then he wound up drawing one of the most famous characters of all time. So, you know, it was certainly, attainable and he, what what that helped me do was it made me believe mm -hmm. you know because first you have to believe yes you know you have to really believe that you can do it that it's available yeah. that the universe will bring this to you you know and not second guess yourself or second guess um one of the other wonderful lessons that he taught me as a young actor was the t the tough skin the rejection part of it you know to believe in myself, no matter what, you know, if, if I didn't get a job, both mom and dad would always say their loss, their loss. And it just really helped me because I never took it personally. I didn't think, Oh, I'm not good because so-and-so didn't hire me. I mean, as an actor, I started to learn that, you know, there's way more roles you don't get than the ones you do get, but you just have to get the right ones. And that's the answer to it all. You know, you just get the you just get the right ones. You don't have to win them all. Exactly. But the ones you win could be pretty good. Could be pretty good. And you yeah. had the the love and support early on, which I think really makes a world of difference. I mean, even the love and support of Golda Meir. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I love that you're showing that picture. Um, that's Ann Bancroft. Yeah, uh, who played Golda on Broadway um, in the show Golda, and that's myself and the actress that played my sister. Um, and it was just such a wonderful experience. I mean, you know, to to work on Broadway first of all, Arthur Penn directed that. Um, you know, to work with Anne Bancroft and everything she is, and the experience mm. and and the the role model she became for me yes. um, was unbelievable. Married to Mel Brooks, who Mel was at the theater very often and getting to know him was incredible but Golda played a big role in the development of the play like she had her hands in on things yes she would often come to you know dress rehearsals and 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 uh run-throughs and readings and you know she was she was there yeah she, you know and then of course opening night where she was so proud but this was a, a dinner that we had gone to. It was just um, the kids. She just took the kids out and Annie. And, um, and we just all went to dinner one night. And one of the things that was, and I might've shared this with your audience in the past, forgive me if I have, but it's worth repeating. And one of the things that she shared with me 
that was so profound that I carry to this day was she said, be the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. And, you know, I was nine years old and, you know, did I understand that Mm -hmm. through a nine year old filter, I guess I understood it, but I remembered it, you know, whether I actually got what she was saying or not, I totally remembered it. And I carried that throughout my whole life, like through my 20s, whatever that meant to me in my 20s and through my 30s, through my 30 year old filter and so on and so forth. But here I am now, my 55 year old filter saying, you know, that's pretty profound. That is be good with yourself. Yes. No one else, no one else completes you. You, know, right. you com- you complete you. There is none of this. You, you know, you complete me thing. It's, no. it's self like you were talking about yes. self. It's right. all about it's all about self. And that's really what she was saying to me. Be the person you want to spend the rest of your life with because you're gonna, you know, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. So so what would the Glenn of today say to the Glenn of then? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, my goodness. Well, you could have you, you could know, have done that role that uh, Brandon Cruz did with Bill Bixby, Courtship of Eddie's Father. Courtship, I used to love that show. Oh <laughs> yes. my gosh, that was one of the one of my favorite shows growing up. Oh my god, you remember the episode where Mrs. Livingston was going to leave the show because she was going to go away? I think back home. That was very rough. We were like, "No, Mrs. Livingston, you cannot leave." <laughs> oh, that's right. I do remember that. That would be fun to watch after all these years. I, I love watching the old shows and. And binging them these days. You haven't changed um, a bit. Well, maybe, maybe I don't just know the glass rims. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to change the shape of my glasses. Um, no, you know, I, I just feel like, hey, Julie, Julie Mercado, I love her. Um, so I, I, I feel like um, what I would say is like, you know, Glenn, hang in there. Yes. Because it's not always going to be easy. It's not yeah. always going to be right. Um, things are not always going to go your way, but you survive, mm-hmm. you know, and be true to yourself, you know, be, be that person you want to spend the rest of your life with, you know, like Golda said, and be authentic. And, you know, I did that as best to my ability. I mean, I, I played the closeted role for a very, very long time in my early days. I mean, the world did, the world expected people, gay people to just be in the closet, um, you know, and then there was a time when I just said, okay, enough of that. This is really truly who I am. And I love myself. And if anyone doesn't like it, oh, well, <laughs> you know, so I just started living, you know, a true sense of myself. Um, so I, I would say, I would say that to my younger self, hang in there and um, be who you are, because who you are is pretty beautiful. Absolutely right. So beautifully said, that's truly what it's all about. And sometimes it, it takes time to to realize that and it takes life experiences, losses, gains. And uh, mm-hmm. it's, it sounds like you've really been uh, learning all the way along. Uh, Maureen in Arizona says such a handsome boy grown into such a handsome man. Thank you, Maureen. I appreciate that. And Julie too. Welcome Julie to the gym master show live. Ah, you little mini Paisan. <laughs> That's so funny. Is that Frank? I think it's, I think that's, I don't know. I said three line. I think that's, I think that's Frank. <laughs> oh that my cousin? goodness. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's a friend that I met in, I think from Jersey, we were in Jersey together. How great is that? Oh, then that's basically, came to, basically a cousin then. <laughs> came to the chiller. Yeah. 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 From Jersey. Came to the, to the chiller autograph show. Uh-huh. And uh, when I was there with Mackenzie, um, yes. Kathleen Walker. Oh my goodness. Hi Kathleen. Kathleen. Yeah. She's a great That's friend. Wonderful. I'm great. so happy. She loves the show. That's oh wonderful. yeah. She's, she's here every night. She's a true lovity. Absolutely. Ah, That's awesome. She, that's awesome. She, she works with the New York Mets too. She lives in Queens. You're, you know, yeah. Kathleen, I don't know if we ever discussed this, but I sang the national anthem at Shea stadium back in the day for the Mets. You did. And yeah, it was quite an experience. It was, it was unbelievable. I was so scared. The Mets were playing their final game of the season to get into the pennant. And they, that was packed. There were 65,000 people in those seats. And I sat on, stood on home plate. And in those days, Jim, they didn't have, they didn't really have any monitors. So all you would hear is the feedback of your own voice delayed. So it would be like, 
oh, say, can you? And then back at you would go, oh, say, can you? And it was like very jarring. <laughs> and they didn't ever, I mean, it was no rehearsal. So I wound up sticking my hands in my ears <laughs> to sing the national anthem because I couldn't hear myself. And, and then I got all this like negative feedback. <laughs> from people saying I was diff- I was like not being nice to the flag oh you were denigrating it all and <laughs> yeah but honestly it had nothing to do you with couldn't that. hear I just, I just I wanted to sing it on key so I couldn't hear this thing back so nowadays they have wonderful like I'm wearing right now you know hey Beach, that's so yes, funny my friend BJ singing. he was the one who who's the one who helped me get booked at the Mets he was there with me that oh, he day. Was. So, he helped yes. you get booked with the Mets. He was working for WAPP Beach. at the time. WAPP, and, that's right. In New York remember City. Remember WAPP? Yes. yes. Brooch. Wow. Cool, so, uh, well, uh, Glenn, as everybody knows, or maybe new viewers around the world don't know, Glenn is originally from New York City, from Staten Island, New York. Right. And I'm from out east on Long Island, which isn't necessarily part of the city, but is suburbs of the city. So, uh, you know, every, might as well be. This is like a whole family reunion here. Uh, my father, Mets fan, because always early as a kid, a Brooklyn Dodger fan. Oh. So when the Dodgers escaped and went west. A lot of them went with the Mets. Oh that's, yeah, uh, that's what happened they, there. They definitely went went with the Mets. Yeah. Um, I've had the joy. Oh, and I want to actually bring this up. I've had the joy of becoming very dear friends. Not that he was a Met, but he was a Yankee. I've been a Yankee fan all my life. Yes. But um, I've, I've become, become a very... New York. Mets are out. I'm a New York fan. So I, because we used to go to Shea and to Yankee Stadium. And Yankee so Stadium. I'm, and I become a New York fan. Whatever New York team's in, I go with it. Well, I always stayed a New York Yankee fan, even though I haven't physically lived in New York in quite a while. But um I, my heart is still in New York. You know, once you're in New York, you're always a New Yorker, I think. I don't know. You can't really shake it. But I become very dear friends with Roger Clemens, baseball great pitcher, yeah. Roger Clemens. And this is the art of his wife. This is um, Debbie Clemens. This is her beautiful piece that she sells, DebbieClemens.com, or at the Andrea Smith Gallery in Sedona. And I just love it. This is Metatron. These are all um, very powerful gems that um, represent Metatron, the Archangel Metatron. And there's so much power to her pieces. And I just love it. I feel always centered and safe. And I just love the look of it. So this is Debbie Clemens, Roger Clemens, beautiful wife, who's a dear friend. How did you guys meet? How did that connection happen with Roger? Well, they have a place in Sedona. Oh, and, they do. Um, I didn't yes. realize that. Wow. Yes. Part time. They live in Sedona. So we hang out. Roger is a um, I, I really met them through my dear friends, Gary and Andrea Smith. Gary and Andrea. Show her yeah. work at the gallery. Um, Maureen's Andrea in Arizona. Is, she wants to know the name of the gallery again. It's called the Andrea Smith Gallery in Tlacopaki. And you will love it. You will not be disappointed. They have all spiritual art. Andrea is known as the world peace artist and has done commissions all over the world. Um, I've been to uh, Bali with them. I've been to Egypt with them. Very um, nice. They take people on spiritually in charge to all these spiritually in charge places. It's remarkable, but they sell just such wonderful work. So yes, please go visit. But that's how I met Roger. And Roger does karaoke parties with us. He did one at our house <laughs> and he, he's called DJ No Request. Because you cannot request a song from the man. He plays whatever he wants. If you know it, stand up and sing it. And sing it. But, so that's that's Roger's MO, but that's the whole that's the whole story behind that. That is really, really cool. I, I know folks, of course, want us to who might be just tuning in, talk about the beloved uh, one day at a time. How did mm. that happen for you? I know it's a story you've probably said seven million four hundred and ninety-three thousand. <laughs> times as always the case but it's always fresh and exciting for folks and you know it is an amazing thing when you get a chance to have a role on a a norman lear project like this with this wonderful roster you know uh, missing from here is Mackenzie and nanette fabre of course as the grandmother and uh right. Pat Shelley Fabre, bonnie franklin valerie valerie yeah. and i know um 
you were very well you're stay close to valerie and to mackenzie but you were yeah. very uh bonnie was sort of like a second mom in a way to you huh oh yes yes i mean they were all family members to me harrington was like you know a, a, a role model like you wouldn't believe in my life too so um i recently went out to lunch with one of his sons and his wife and harrington's um beautiful wife so you know i stay close with all of them and all their families um bonnie's family is like my family my friend julie who's her stepdaughter is one of my dearest friends still her stepson jed is one of my dearest friends he lives here in glendale as a matter of fact we just oh, saw wow. each other a couple of weeks ago yeah um so yeah i mean it was the a, a part of a lifetime for me that set was so happy and yeah. fun and like it never felt like work we would all go to work um I saw an interview that Michael Lembeck did recently. And basically he said, you figure like we'd get there at 10 and, you know, yeah. we'd be out by six or whatever. And, you know, it was an hour for lunch. We worked about six hours, but really we laughed for about six hours. Like yeah. we got our, we got our, we got it done. We got, yeah. we crossed the finish line. That's for sure. Everyone on that show was such a pro, but we did it with humor and fun and creativity and you know a lot of that was thanks to pat harrington truly yes. he was just he was the funniest man in the world and he was like that all the time yeah like he was on he was cracking jokes he was down to earth and just so loving everyone on that show was so loving truly yeah so so i got the part valerie bertinelli helped me get the part she doesn't admit to that but I, I was doing um, Richard III on Broadway with Al Pacino. That's Valerie, right. I had met, and she had come to the show. I had met Valerie prior to One Day at a Time. And she, had, she and her boyfriend at the time, Scott Columbia, had come to the show. And I introduced her to Pacino. And on the way out of the theater, she said, if there's anything I could ever do for you, Glenn, just ask. So cut to now, you know, my mom is sitting in the backyard of, in Staten Island. She's reading the TV guide and there was this article that Mackenzie Phillips had been struggling with her drug addiction and that they were letting her go and they would probably be adding a 14 year old boy to the show of which I was like, what? So I tracked Valerie down <laughs> do, <laughs> doing it, doing it. Cause I went, okay, wait a minute. Valerie said, if I ever have a question. Um, and I basically, you know, uh, tracked her down doing a TV movie and she was like, oh my gosh, I was talking to Bonnie today and she said that she wants someone with theater credits. She goes, I saw you on Broadway. It would be fantastic. I'm totally recommending you. I'm highly recommending you. So I just had to audition. That's why Valerie always says, you got yourself the part. I didn't get you the part. But look, if you get into an audition and you've got the seal of approval from Valerie Bertinelli, that does not hurt. Okay? Mm -mm. No. So I definitely had a, a a leg up in my opinion. Well, and, uh, you know, I still I, thank her for that. Oh, that's a beautiful thing too. Um, and this is a great shot too, huh? The one day. I love it. And you know, it's so funny. I just showed Johnny that last night because yes. I don't have that jacket anymore. And you know? yeah. I wish I did. And if anyone out there ever finds those jackets on eBay, send it to me. I will buy it in a heartbeat. So just saying that out loud, I want a one day at a time jacket again. He wants his own jacket. <laughs> yes. It won't have my name on it because I think mine is, I think mine burnt in my fire. I lost everything in the fire. So people might not um, know that that happened. Yeah. There was a house yeah. fire situation and yeah, you know, that happened years ago to uh, the saxophone player, Kenny G also. I remember. Right. I heard that. California. Yes. Um, and Mackenzie, Mackenzie lost her, her everything in a fire too. Yeah. <sighs> The same thing, exactly. Yeah, we have we, every she, day. And, she and I have that in common for sure. You know, I think one of the reasons why they brought you on to one day at a time is you, uh, and you could see it too. You had a lot of energy and passion and a lot of uh, spunk, and <laughs> and that that's really required. You know, so, the Norman Lear sitcoms were really very often one day at a time was called a dramedy. Um, and so were shows like Maud and, and All in the Family, they all had pathos, you know, and at moments, you know, such realness. Because I think that's what the whole idea of situation comedies were, is Norman took that so literally that this is the situation in our lives, you know. So we really have him to thank for that. Um, 
for that flavor and that brand and that and that tone, which was so important in the seventies and eighties to start introducing. I mean, there was, there was life before Norman Lear and then TV after Norman Lear. And that was when it all changed. So very grateful to have been um, on one of his shows in particular, but that, that, that episode was one of my favorites, you know, Bonnie and I just played in such a great world. That was really the time. I mean, I had been on the show for, you know, one season, I think it was the end of my first season. And, I, I knew I was like grooving. Oh, this is my dog. I'm so sorry. Ah, there's like, oh no. there is somebody. Ah, Johnny's coming. Let home. him in. Let him in. He's they love on, that. He got home early. Yay! I'm on. <laughs> I'm on YouTube, babe. <laughs> I Jim know. Master I'm on with show. Jim. Ma- I'm on the Jim Master Show. Ah, that's <laughs> what happens when. That's what happens when Johnny comes home. Poco goes crazy. Johnny Poco come goes lately. Crazy. <laughs> Johnny come lately. Exactly. So um. <laughs> But but you know what was wonderful about that was that was the episode where Bon and I just totally connected on you know our chemistry. We just knew that we had something so good, and I think it really um, it definitely embedded me in that show in a way I hadn't been. Oh look, everyone's saying hello to John and to that's, Poco. That's what happens. Oh they, my God, come over here, stick your yeah. head here, Johnny. Oh yeah, a lot of come people here, bring like, Poco they, home. They show they the pet, you- yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you get a little glimpse of what my life looks like right now. This is John. Hey Come there. there. Welcome, John. That, that's There's Jimmy the family. Welcome. There's the family. Aww, Love it, huh? Oh, my gosh. Look how cute. My two boys. Hello. That is really cool, huh? Yes, and, I'm and, so and, glad we got the... Hi, babe. Right. And Glenn, you were saying that uh, John, you know, involved in some of the most beloved of the game shows game and shows, all kinds right. of cool things. We had, uh, of course, the mutual friend Wink Martindale and Sandy were on the show just a couple Can you weeks hear this? ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and they were phenomenal. just on the show a couple of weeks ago. Just You're a couple kidding. Weeks they were just ago. on the show. Oh, Wink and yeah. Sandy. Oh, that's great. Yeah, oh, they're my amazing. Gosh. Uh, tell us, John, about some of the shows you've had an opportunity to work on. It's kind of cool. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, I do a lot with the $100,000 Pyramid, which is coming back in a couple of weeks. Uh, at least we're taping it. And uh, I'm working on 25 Words or Less right now with uh, Meredith Vieira. And uh, I've done some work in the past with College Bowl and uh, America Says and just a whole bunch of fun. You know, it's a tough life playing games all day. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Meredith Vieira the best? She's so professional but has this witty dry sense of humor oh, love yeah. meredith oh she's, yeah no she's, it's, it's a lot yeah. of fun he's and, literally uh, just I coming just, home just from, came home yeah. for the studio they just were recording six shows today six shows with meredith today six shows huh yeah wow six, a day. six a, a day it's a big day. day how did you get into the game show world oh my goodness uh i just loved it so much growing up and the short story is I created a game years ago. It got produced as a PC game. And then I just used to pick up the phone and start calling people and didn't know you weren't supposed to do that and uh, made some friends. And um, one thing led to another and and um, got my way out here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and got my way out here and just started working the business and, and haven't stopped uh, yet. It's too much now, time. have you been a contestant on any of the shows, too? Because I know when everybody goes. No, I never way. have. And uh, they all want the prices is right all the time. Point. Oh, I need to get on the prices right. And right. Everyone <laughs> wants that. But yeah, he can never be a contestant. And I don't think unless I'm a celebrity yeah. guest, I am never allowed to be a contestant either because now I know this guy. That's it, right? That's it. <laughs> Dwight <laughs> says, tell us the story about Match Game. Tell the story about Match Game. Me? Yeah. yeah. To him? I, I think... Uh, Dwight, are you saying for Glenn to say that, or you want uh, you want John to say it here? Tell us, tell us which one you want. He might have been talking about Family Feud. That Family Feud, there. right? But, exactly. But Johnny, Johnny, um, we Johnny has these amazing. Well, first of all, all his friends are game show like gurus. Oh yeah, they all they all work on game shows or have been on game shows. So they when our we do our family game nights. It's yes. like being on television. Yeah, it is un right. Yes, and also we have fantastic stars that come to our house and play games. So, uh, oh, that's so cool. We bring we bring all the friends. Mackenzie's been there. Jill Whelan, Laurie Handler from Give Me a Break, Kari Michaelson. 
Who else comes to our show? Oh my God, Eileen Graff and Teresa Gansell. Uh, and uh, Eileen was a guest so on the show. show. She's great, Eileen Graff. She was here. Yes, wonderful. She is. She I, is. Did I tell you, Glenn, that it was a few years okay, back? He's going oh, to get back. He's just getting yeah. home Thanks from work, so he's going to. Yeah, I competed to be a game settle. show host on the Game Show Network. <laughs> really? No, I did not know that. You'd be so fantastic. Yeah, they were going through town when the Game Show Network went. They weren't even calling it GSN. It was Game Show Network. Yeah. And uh, they came to town, and uh, there was about 5,000 people from all around the world who uh, showed up. And uh, they just threw you out on stage, and there was no set or anything. They just had mm -hmm. the judges there. I think Mark Summers was there from Nickelodeon. Yeah, Mark Summers, one of John's dearest friends. We just went up to see him in a couple of weeks ago. Up in Tony was there. The Synergy Group was there. And uh, they just threw us out on stage. It was literally about 5,000 people. It was like, you know, <laughs> an Elvis concert. Just people lined up around the buildings. And it was really amazing. So a couple of colleagues said, Jim, you should, you know, go. You've done a lot of hosting over the years. You should go and try it. You've always followed game shows as well. And so I went. It was really, really cool. And uh, they threw us out on stage. They just wanted to see if we could talk, if we could relate, if people were nervous or not, if they were sort of shy or they ran off stage. So we got through that part, and then we had another round, another round, another round. I think it got whittled down from 5,000 to 2,000 to 900, 500, 100, 25, and then wow. there were three <laughs> out of 5,000 people. It was incredible. And, and you were one of them? Yes. And the, the person wow. that won was a, uh, a female, I think, from Boston. She was married with kids. And at that time, they had they were looking for a female because there really weren't a lot of female game show hosts. So uh, she won, but myself and the the other guy who was left, it was fantastic because uh, we won a twenty seven inch Sony TV, <laughs> fabulous letter from the Game Show Network. And what they did was when we were down to three out of the five thousand people. That alone, you know, because it was just a random thing that I said, let me go because I've done a lot of television and give it a shot just to see what they saw, to see if they saw any potential or any, you know, interest in it. And they actually, that final day, they had a set that they built with contestants, Mark Summers, everybody was lined up. It was really serious. They were taking notes. They were judging. And, uh, it was kind of interesting what they did, but, you know, I had the whole sport coat, the whole routine, the game show look. And uh, they sort of rigged it in a way where the buzzers for the contestants didn't work because they wanted to see how you can handle disaster. If you can make levity out of it or, you, or you're going to panic and like, uh oh, and freeze and wait for everybody else to do it. When at times like that is when you have to rise to the occasion, as you know, and make magic and those are some of my favorite times on radio and television where right. things have gone wrong and I've had to step up and bring people together and make them laugh or what have you. And that's exactly what we did. And it was really, really cool. The, uh, the woman who won, she uprooted the family from Boston. She went out to uh, LA for this new show they were doing for Game Show Network, but it got canceled in 30 days. Wow. So it's kind of like, oh, maybe, you know, <laughs> that was, <laughs> but that happens. We know in this industry, television and all, it's, uh, you know, it could yeah. be. Uh, <laughs> you win some, you win some, you lose some. That's for sure. The meeting hour with Peter Marshall, PBS special, Jim. <laughs> you guys are funny. Oh uh, my gosh. Dwight. Hi, Dwight. So good Pete, to talk to you, dude. Another legend, Peter Marshall. And uh, you guys had a chance to uh, visit with him recently too, right? Tell us about that. He's a, you know, a beloved, beloved guy. Yeah, he really is such a wonderful man. So I hosted um, a daytime NBC show with he and Peter and, and Leslie Uggams called oh, fantasy yeah. that's right on nbc daytime they brought me on nbc brought me on for a summer so i i co-hosted with them for june july and august of 1983 um it was a daily show so we did quite a quite a number of episodes and we became lifelong friends and um you know it's really interesting because you know johnny being a game show producer you know and his world you know our worlds collide very often let's just put it that way so, you know, Peter has been sort of 
um, a mentor and uncle to me and Wink has been that for John. So very recently we've spent time with both of them. Yeah, there's Wink and Sandy who you've had on the show. That's Johnny and I when we went to Palm Springs to see those guys. And that's so great. Sandy and I actually share a birthday. Our birthdays are July 6th. Um, so we actually share a birthday, which is fabulous. And just spending time with Wink, you know, is just so, he just loves Johnny so much. He just has such, you know, John's part of their family for sure, as Peter is to me, you know. So it's just so wonderful that we have our, our game show gurus as, uh, as yeah. uncles, or you, if you will. Um, but Peter, Peter and John, their paths have crossed. I had never met Wink. Believe it or not, I had never met Wink before that that trip. Tic Tac Doe and the whole bit, huh? And God, the whole the bit. The amount of shows yeah, he's hosted, unbelievable. I know so many. Our, we have never our paths have not crossed, but um, John's path has crossed with Peter. So we recently together went to go see him. Who and he's you know he just turned ninety six years old. I think exactly. I might have sent you. Did I send you a he's, picture of Peter? I think, I think you I, did. Could you believe, he, well, believe he's 96? 96. And I got to say, he got COVID at 94 and beat it. So God bless him that he actually did that. You know, Lori, who's a dear friend, his wife, um, you know, called and said, just prepare yourselves. He's in hospice. We brought hospice in, so on and so forth. And then he was like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to go. I'm just not ready. So they brought in all this kind of oxygen and just beefed up whatever they can do to help his lungs. And God bless it. He's still with us now at 96 years old and sharp as a tack doing wonderful, you know, um, I'm just so proud of him. He, he, I always call him my superhero. <laughs> he's definitely, he's definitely a superhero. Could you see yourself hosting a game show? Oh, heck yeah. That would be so fun. I mean, you, you do have a connection on yeah. <laughs> who's in the kitchen right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, that would be so much fun. He and I are developing something. So we'll see if that all, if that all goes into fruition. It's so early to talk about things like that because, you know, this business, there's no guarantees in show business. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it is go with the flow. I mean, that's why when I, when I started my company in Sedona, and I have to say on May 4th, which is coming up in about a month, a month from today is actually that yes. we're recording this. Yeah. Um, I, my, my station in Sedona, the local station is 20 years old. Congratulations. So, thank you so much. I started that 20 years ago this year. So I'm, I'm blown away because in show business, it's very rare that you have the same job for that long. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yes. We actually have a uh, clip that you sent, Sedona Now TV, um, which is really, really cool. Let, what, let's I show don't, that. Yeah. Let's see what I sent. Okay. All right. I think it's the one advertised with, which is oh, kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. Right, cool. Uh, let's show that. And uh, right on. You, you could take a swig. You've earned it. <laughs> Here it is, gang. Hi, I'm Glenn Scarpelli, and you're watching Sedona Now. Sedona Now TV has been the leader in visitor entertainment television for almost two decades. Here's what some of our clients have to say about us. Hi, I'm Wendy from Chalakapaki, and I wanted to give my testimonial to Sedona Now. I've been working with them nonstop, 100%, without interruption for almost 19 years now. And I have to say that this is the single most requested form of advertising from my tenants um, in the complex. And I also need to say that you always know when it's working because when you're out and about in town, people always say, hey, I saw you on Sedona now. So kudos to Sedona now, looking for 19 more years. All I can say is, where would we be without Sedona now? When I think of the years that we go back, it's nearly two decades. I'll never forget the first opportunity to have my first commercial on Sedona now. It is my heart and my soul and my pleasure to be a part of the Sedona now family. And now is the time that we get the most benefit. Our guests talk to us about it all the time. I love Sedona now. Thank you for everything you've done for us for almost 20 years. 
Hi, I'm Patrick Schweiss, director of the Sedona International Film Festival, and I want to let you know that Sedona Now is an integral part of our success. We've been partners for many, many years, and they are the best investment we could possibly make in advertising dollars and exposure here in the Sedona area. They truly cover it all. We constantly have people coming into the Mary D. Fisher Theater and to the Sedona International Film Festival and said, we saw you on Sedona Now, and that's a huge testament to their reach and to just how effective your advertising dollars are. I would strongly encourage you to support Sedona Now, put an advertising campaign together. It's well, well worth it, and you will see results. Seen in more hotel rooms than any other local station, reaching nearly 2 million overnight visitors a year. And we're proud to be the only local station seen in these hotels. We have now grown statewide in our premier partnership with ABC 15 Arizona. Look who's here in Sedona, folks. It's Susan Casper and Terry O from Sonoran Living. We are so excited to be here with Mr. Sedona. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Glenn Scarpelli, discover Sedona now. We love it. Every Friday on Sonoran Living on ABC 15. Catch us. 9 a.m. Hi, my name is Gary Smith, and I'm co-owner of the Andrea Smith Gallery in Sedona, Arizona. And I'd just like to say that I've been working with Sedona now for the past 18 years. And I've never had a greater response to our art than through this TV station. And now it's unbelievable. I'm seen on ABC TV in Phoenix that has made a great change in my business. I can't tell you how excited we are working with Sonoran Living and Sedona now, along with Glenn Scarpelli and his team. The results have been unbelievable, and we're so thrilled to be a part of the team. I'm Terry O from Sonoran Living, and we are so excited to have Glenn Scarpelli and Sedona Now a part of Sonoran Living, and you can be a part of it too. Come join us. As an ABC 15 partnered production company, our production values include a cinema quality gear package and have been honored with four Rocky Mountain Emmy nominations. So with the largest TV reach in the Verde Valley, HD broadcasting in many locations, and statewide visibility, why wouldn't you want to be a part of our family? We look forward to hearing from you. Now you know. Mm. Congratulations, uh. 20 years, my friend. That is absolutely amazing. And a lot of the viewers are wishing the very same could you believe it's 20 years? I mean, that's wow. so great. Thank you so much, Denise. I saw Denise there too. Yes. Hi, Denise. Yeah. So, so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. 20 years. I just can't believe it. I started it when I was 12. Of course. And that's usually 12 <laughs> is usually what I always say. It's a nice <laughs> round number. It's a nice round number, you know? It, it just yes. sounds, 12 sounds believable, doesn't it? It always I does. Could, it could happen. And, Maureen um, says her daughter works at ABC 15. How oh cool is this? Gosh. Wow, yes. Maureen, that's so awesome. Small Who's world, huh? I know them all. Yes, indeed. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm just so grateful for everyone that was in that video, all my clients that I've been working with for so long. My buddy it, Gary Smith was on, the one I was telling you about that sells Debbie Clement jewelry and and just everyone, Pat from the from the film festival, and Wendy from Talakapaki, and Lisa Dahl, who owns incredible restaurants. If you come to Sedona, you must hit one of her six restaurants. They oh, are yes. she built an empire. But anyway, if you need, if anyone needs to know anything about Sedona, I am in the know, people. I call this reach out here because I know <laughs> from Staten Island to Sedona. <laughs> I'm telling you. It's the truth. Johnny loves it out there now. You know, he had never been to Sedona until we started dating. Beautiful so, area. Yeah. Yeah. So we go back and forth all the time. Like I said, I really feel these days I have the best of both worlds because I too, Jim, really love the ocean. And yes. of course, in Sedona, we don't have an ocean. So we have a creek, which is lovely and a wonderful body of water for the desert, but it ain't no ocean. So you know, the, the, the landscape in Sedona is absolutely breathtaking and the lifestyle is incredible. And I love the life I built, but I really love going back and forth now. So you have the ability to go back and forth, which is fantastic. 
You uh, mentioned the beloved Peter Marshall, and we do have that photo. Look at that. Ah, huh? there you go. There we were just visiting him not too long ago, just a couple of months ago. Folks and will know he was gosh. the original host of Hollywood Squares and so much more. Just a yeah. class act, you know, one of those classy guys. Absolutely. And honestly, when I was working on fantasy with him and he would give me tips, like I was just in awe that, you know, I, I felt so honored that I was, I was being groomed and taught by one of the greatest TV hosts of all time. Truly. Yeah. Yes. It's really set the bar and, uh, just got it that old school quality and just really, really cool stuff. Really yeah. amazing. He was he was one of the first people I ever came out to also. Peter Marshall. Close, yeah, Peter Marshall. And it meant so much to him. I didn't think it was actually gonna mean so much to him as it was to me, you know. And um he shared with me that Paul Lind never came out to him. Never, they never even had a conversation about being gay. A different time, and yeah. It was a very different time. But what we have to realize is that, like, I and I say this to all the my my gay compadres out there that maybe are on the fence about being honest about who they are. You know, it means just as much to our straight friends to let to, it's it's a symbol of love and trust when you come out to someone or be vulnerable in any way, actually to another friend because then they feel loved too, knowing that you took the time to express yourself and expose yourself and be true to yourself. And um, it's a two way street. So there's just a lot of love. You talk about levity. There's a lot of love that happens when we, when we fall into our authentic selves and there's Johnny and I, that's at one of um, the restaurants I was telling you about. And that's in Sedona when, when John and I go to Sedona and I got to say, you know, when it came to this relationship, what's beautiful for me in, in being with Johnny is I really believe in the law of attraction, you know, and I just don't mean attraction between two people. I mean, when we do the work inside, yeah, then our outside circumstances align. Yes. So, you know, in the work that I was doing since the last time I was on the show, I really just realigned my inner being. Like I realigned mm -hmm. to see what works for me. I got more real with myself. Yes. I got more honest with myself. I found a new kind of um, contentment and, and, and solace with me first. And then this perfect being kind of just came in very, very gently and easily and quickly once I really made that shift in myself. Um, so the universe does, you know, know who we are and brings us what we need, you know, but that alignment of doing the work inside first had to happen before, you know, this beautiful being can come into my life. So I'm very grateful. Beautifully said, very inspiring too. Here's another great photo we have. Look at uh, that. Uh, yes. The, yeah. That is from the TV Land Awards. Um, that was in New York City, the, the Big Apple. We all flew to New York to do that. That was the last time we were ever all together. Bonnie passed away almost a year to the day. This was April 12th, I think. And she died May, um, I'm sorry, March 1st of the following year. Yeah. So like 11 months, 11 months later, Bonnie passed away. You know, I was very, like, I, like you had said, I was very close with Bon. And I knew she was also starting to not feel well. She would complain about stomach issues. Mm -hmm. um, little did we know it was pancreatic cancer. And then, right. you know, with that one in particular, sometimes by the time you hear it, it's too late. So, um, you know, we did lose Bon. And then Harrington died almost, I don't know, about nine months after Bonnie. So that was the last time we were all together um, that picture means so much to me it's hanging up in my office yeah framed Mackenzie doesn't like it as much because there, she says her eyes look a little cockeyed there but <laughs> I, still, I, still, I still I still love I still love that picture <laughs> she's like I look stoned and for once I'm actually not stoned <laughs> but, but but she but yeah. I love it anyway I have it hanging up in my office um, well, hey, here's another one that goes back a little bit, but this is with somebody else, Cindy Lauper, huh? Uh, Cindy Lauper. This was backstage at 
American Bandstand. So I did it. I had an album um, when I was, uh, gosh, 17, 16, maybe set going on 17. And I got booked on American Bandstand. And she was the other guest that day. No one knew her. She was brand new. She she saying girls just want to have fun and time That's after right. time, and I was like, oh, you know, I think this, I think she's got a career. <laughs> <laughs> she could go places. She could one. go places. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, did she! And I love her. Yes. I ran into her not too long ago. It was fun to reconnect with her. She did a yes. guest spot on um, a Fran Drescher show called Happily Divorced. Oh yes. Um, which was on the TV land. I went to the, I went to the taping of that. Cause my, one of my buddies, uh, Frank Lombardi was a writer on the show. And, um, and I got to see, I got to see her after all those years. So that was kind of cool. And it yeah. was it like time hadn't passed time after time, time after time. Perfect segue. Perfect segue. Yes, Here's what you to do. This is when you were chatting with uh, Dick Clark, right? Yes, that was American Bandstand. In fact, John and his friends at ABC, because, you know, he does Pyramid on ABC, went through the archives because I had no pictures from American Bandstand. And they looked through the ABC archives and found these pictures. So now I have actual prints that I hang up physically on the wall. Old school, Jim. Yes. And, um, and this is one of the ones I treasure because that's such a great shot. I'm just so just so proud to have been on that show now was singing something that you knew you wanted to do as well like you said when you were a kid you were really selling the parents on the acting was the singing something that you knew you wanted to do or how did that happen yeah you know i always sang in yeah. some ways i sang before i acted you know I, I i loved it i was born in the wrong generation i was one of those kids like i knew i watched every mgm musical I listened to Sinatra and Bobby Darin when I was growing up. Like they were my idols. I I certainly um, was very motivated by music and specifically musicals. Yeah. So I always knew I would do musical theater. Like, so that was all part of the vision. Yeah. It was, it was performing. I, I, I always begged to be a performer, I would say more so than just an actor, you know, even to the point of climbing poles. Ah. <laughs> uh- <laughs> Well, you just see, hanging around with Glenn. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically the way this works out is I'm still a pole dancer. I don't know yes. if you know this about me. Yes. But I did my research. <laughs> yes. Every, every Thursday night in Sedona, you can come catch me pole dancing at one of the famous restaurants. I'm kidding. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say something else, but this is a family show. <laughs> Uh, they wouldn't believe it with that uh, that face there, that mug, you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. It's fooled a lot of people, that mug, that's, let me tell you. That's it, that's <laughs> it. This is a great shot, too, of some uh, of uh, TV's favorites, huh? Yes, indeed, all my favorite friends. And, you know, um, I just had lunch with Mindy Cohn this past Friday, really? and she and I, yeah, if you go to my Instagram doing? page, I posted a picture from it. She's doing so wonderful. I'm so proud of her. That's She's, great. you know, a, a cancer survivor. Yes. And just everything that she does in her life is just, she's an inspiration, truly. And Kim Fields and I text all the time. I was texting with her this weekend. We're still in touch. Todd Bridges I've seen recently. Daniel Breezebois, who's in that picture too. Yes. She and I keep in touch. She's out your way now, though. She moved east. She did so- come east, huh? Yeah, so I haven't seen her physically in a very long time. So one of these days when I get to New York, I told her we are going to get together. Oh, that's awesome, huh? Yes. That is fantastic. And like you say, Kim Fields in the middle there as well. It's, yes. I tell you, huh? <laughs> it, great times. Remember I mentioned uh, one of the reasons why they probably selected you for One Day at a Time is they saw, you know, this – East Coast kid coming with his thirst, his passion, his energy, and his spunk. Well, I know that you had that actually verified from the guy who told Mary Tyler Moore she had spunk at Asner. Uh, Ed. <laughs> yes, indeed. How's that for a segue? Oh that was a great segue, Jim. Yes, he. You got spunk. Um, yeah. um, 
Ed has always been really wonderful to me. The reason I, I knew him was because he and Harrington are were very close dear friends, like oh, best yeah. friends. And they worked together very often. Um, they had their advocacy that they did together. They had their politics. Ed ran for um, uh, for the president of SAG. And yes. I know Har- Harrington, I think he might have even won, if I recall. Yes. Um, and Harrington uh, was on his campaign board and, you know, helped him, you know, do that. And they were very, very close. So this picture happened to be taken in Sedona, believe mm-hmm. it or not. In uh, at the Sedona International Film Festival, um, Ed used to come out all the time. So every time he'd come out, we'd make sure we got together and went to dinner or something. So, and Mary Tyler Moore was my favorite show growing up. Oh my gosh, I love that show so much. Uh... So, so just to share with you, also Johnny and I both last year, as soon as we met, we both had hernia surgeries, long overdue hernia surgeries. Did you really? Yeah, so how romantic. We nursed our way, or we nursed each other through hernia surgeries in the first year of our relationship. Now, was it a but... two-for-one discount special or yeah. something? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do no, it now. But... There's a two-for-one. Buy one, get one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, he did his first, and then I was able to nurse him, and then I he was all good. Yeah, you saw he survived that, and it was good, and then you said, I think, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> yes, and we call them we call them matching him and him hymnias instead of hernias. <laughs> so, so we had we we shared our hymnia surgeries, and during our um, you know, getting better, our healing process, we binge watched from the beginning the entire seven seasons of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. So it was so wonderful. It was so wonderful to watch after all this time and to, um laugh along and brought up so many memories i just love that show and seeing ed is so wonderful you know what's cool is those nostalgic networks networks like decades and uh antenna tv and cozy tv with yeah. on the weekends they do these binge weekends with some of the beloved series where the whole two days is you know the mary tyler moore show Dick and yeah. Dyson, whatever it may be which is really cool i think they've even done it with the love boat. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Exciting and new. Yes. Jack Jones. So uh, for the folks watching, because I know they love this story too, how did this happen? I mean, everybody who was anybody at the time period was on that show or Fantasy yeah. Island. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I, I I was on one day at a time and I was asked to do it, you know, but I really was best friends with Jill Whelan from Love Boat and oh, I still yes. am. Yeah. We see each other all the time. Um, I just texted with her a couple days ago and we're going to get together for dinner very soon. Cool. Um, and we're going to see each other. Oh, wait, at the at the autograph show this year, which I know we're going to get to. Yes. Uh, Jill, Jill, too, is going to be there and Mackenzie and a whole bunch of us. And um but that's, you know, Jill was my first screen kiss ever. Like I'd wow. never kissed a, I'd never kissed a girl. I kissed a girl and I liked it. And I liked and, it. <laughs> and it was Jill. And uh, we had such a good time. I did three episodes of Love Boat, two of which I had a storyline with Jill. Yeah. And one of which it was, um, you know, a separate, a separate storyline. It was Jimmy Osmond and I oh, yeah. who had a storyline together, which was fabulous. But I love working on that show. It was so fun. I didn't get as, I only got as far as Santa Monica Boulevard, though. No, I never went on a real cruise. You know, they would only do the real cruises once or twice a year. Otherwise, it was all done in a studio. So, um, so I, I definitely got to at least get on the show, but it was never on a cruise. We uh, and of course the captain, Captain Steubing, was Gavin McLeod, who we lost uh, about a year or so ago, and mm-hmm. uh, who played his wife on the Mary Tyler Moore Show was Joyce Bullifant. She's going to be with yes. us on Thursday. Oh, that's so be, wonderful! So it'll be her return visit as well, which is kind of cool. I love it. Well, wonderful. Tell her I said hi. We all did the uh, Hollywood Museum Squares. Johnny actually was one of yes. the producers. Yes. Of uh, that's how he and I met doing was Hollywood the, Museum Square, which yeah. is fantastic. So you know Donnell Dad again at the Hollywood Museum. She's amazing. Yes. She? She's been oh a guest. My gosh. She's been with us, and and the and the Hollywood <clears throat> Museum is amazing. Really, yeah. I love it. I love supporting it any way I can. Absolutely, really, really cool people, and it's just going back a little bit. Angelian, Angelian, yes, indeed. So. 
so this is Jennifer Slept here, a short-lived sitcom that I really wish continued on. It was such a wonderful experience. It was so wonderful. Um, I have a Facebook friend, Michael Johnson, who finds all this incredible stuff online and buys it for me or sends it to me. I mean, he's just so generous. And he found Jennifer Slept here in, in its entirety on DVD. And Johnny and I just binge watched the entire 13 episodes. And it was so fun to see. I hadn't remembered half of what I watched. Like, I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, so, yeah, it's just so wonderful. Um, Annie and I, uh, we all got together um, for breakfast not too long ago, like a couple of months ago. So I hadn't yeah. seen her in a very long time. And she's doing fantastic. Of course, Georgia Ingle there, another Georgia Mary Tyler Ingle. Moore connection. That's right. She passed. She had, she has passed away. But um, I knew so many of the folks from the Mary Tyler Moore show. I was so grateful that my life actually somehow intertwined with these people. Intertwined with them all. Even though I grew up as just a fan. So. You said that you sang at Shea Stadium. I believe you also sang at the White House. Yes. And you yeah, were requested. Well, you yeah. You did your homework, I did, buddy. I did a little <laughs> extra digging. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, I got to sing um, for George H.W. Bush. This was probably 1989 or something like that, maybe. Yeah. Um, and it was just an incredible experience. I, I, I can't even put into words to be asked to be at the White House. Um, my agent called me and said, I have someone that wants to talk to you on the other line. I said, really? They said, yes, it's the first lady. It was Barbara Bush. And I was like, get out of here. And they're yeah. like, no, no, really, really it is. I'm like, come on, Barbara Bush has called Barbara me. Barbara Bush, yeah. And they put her on the phone. It really was Barbara Bush. And she said, darling, I love one day at a time. Will you come sing for us or for the kids? Because <laughs> it was a children's charity event on yes. Easter. So, Isn't that beautiful? So they, did they do the Easter egg hunt, the roll and all that that they yes. do? Yes, yes. Yeah. That was cool. what was going on around me as we took that picture. So, does that sport coat have a? Does it have tails too? No, I just think in the eighties I wore my clothes. I wore my sports coats big. <laughs> That's cool. Do you still <laughs> have that? Big, you don't have that big either, shoulder do you? pads. No, I don't have anything. I don't have any of that stuff. I don't know if I'd wear that anymore. <laughs> A few things, but not that one, right? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not that jacket, but the one from American Bandstand I would wear. Now this is terrific. I have to keep doing this. I know, right? Popping, popping my head around. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> it's it's like do yoga as well on this show, and now uh, everybody move to the left. To the right. <laughs> <laughs> downward dog, Poco. Downward dog. Yes, it's um, a, they were yeah. young, huh? So this is this is going to happen April 15, 16 here in Los Angeles, actually at, at the Ooh. Burbank Airport Hilton. Oh, um, yeah. I've stayed there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So me, Mackenzie, and Richard, Richard Masser, who is such an incredible actor, did so many more things besides One Day at a Time, of course. Yeah. Wasn't so he Brent's boyfriend on Rhoda? Yes, yes. Yes. He also did episodes of Mary Tyler Moore. He did yes. episodes of All in the Family. He's been on, he's been on everything. Um, the film Scavenger Hunt. I don't know if you saw that. We actually watched that recently. Oh, yes. Johnny, yeah, Johnny and his friends love it. So we uh, we we watched that and um, we're going to tease him about, we're going to tease Richard about that when we see him <laughs> in two weeks. So that's two weeks, less a little less than two weeks, April 15, 16. It's Very Easter weekend cool. and it's going to be so much fun. So if you're in the area, come out and come out and visit. It's Julie said, you guys are too funny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> thanks, Jewel. We were last time too. binge watch, go back and see the first episode. It was really, really cool. <laughs> okay. <good. laughs> and then this, yeah. So this is happening at the autograph show too. This Charo. Is be a love, a love boat reading. Charo. Coochie, coochie. Coochie, coochie. Coochie, coochie, gym masters. <laughs> That's my charm. That's my, that's my charm impersonation. I'm not, I'm no rich little. Let's put it that way. But, but, or, or Fred Travelina, but I, I or try. Jim Meskimum, who is terrific. Marion Ross's son, Jim. He's an incredible impressionist. He's coming on really? Saturday night. Marion Ross's wow. son. Yeah. Comedian impressionist. He's really I good. No, I did not yeah. know that. Really, really cool. As you, as you can see here, we have um, wow. um, James Darren, who I love. He was actually a guest on One Day at a Time, too. 
and the great Marla Gibbs, who I adore. My God, yes. Marla, Marla is in her 90s now. From, and um, 227 and from the Jeffersons. Yeah. Yes, yes. I have a friend named Mandel if that would watch this and kiss you right now because you put 227 before the Jeffersons. Okay? He loves 227 so much. Jack Hay. But Jack Hay. No, most people say the Jeffersons first. That's all. They I'm say saying. the Jeffersons first, right. But you said 227 first. So, Mandel, that one was for you, buddy. That's for you, Mandel. That's for you, exactly. Mandel. Exactly. And then, of course, Mackenzie and... Um, uh, Patrick Wayne. Patrick Wayne and I actually were on the same episode of Love Boat. We weren't in the same storyline, but we were on the same episode. And we were Bernie right? from from um, Welcome Back, Cotter. So yeah. So I mean, it's going to be so much fun. There's my buddy Jill Whelan up there too. That is so cool, huh? Yes. That's absolutely amazing. So that's coming up. That's exciting. And then of course, this gentleman has meant so much to you in your life. And did you see that video he did? He did this unbelievable, and I believe this was uh, you celebrating his 99th. Now I believe is going to be a hundred. Um, he did this really cool cell phone video that he posted of him on a rocking chair at the family home in Vermont oh, mm -hmm. with the kids, and, and you don't yeah. see you don't see the family. They're inside the house. But he's holding the cell phone. Now here, you know, prolific television producer, the whole thing, studios, cameras. It's just him on a rocking chair holding the cell phone himself. And he said, I'm Norman Lear. I'm 99. I've done everything I've wanted to do. My, you know, my family, my loving family is inside the house. We're at the house. That was always my wife and I sort of getaway up in Vermont. Now the kids own it and run it. We're here. We're enjoying this beautiful, quiet time. I mean, he, he's having a lemonade in a rocking chair on the porch at the Vermont house. It's beautiful. It's sunny. And then he turns the cell phone camera around. He says, now, come on, look at this. Look, look mm. at what I'm seeing. And it's yeah. this breathtaking view of the Vermont mountains and the Vermont countryside, lush green grass and beautiful mountains in the distance with the sun bouncing off them. And he's like, who's better than me? <laughs> That's pretty much how he ended it. And yeah. it was just basic. And he posted it on the 99th. And just, he has kind of like Neil Simon and a few others, this uncanny understanding of the human condition yeah. and has been able to share it, you know, for our great entertainment through television and so much right. more with all these great series like one day at a time and all in the right. family Maud and so many others, uh, somebody that means a great deal to you, huh? My friend. Oh yeah. I mean the great Norman Lear. I mean, what can you say? I mean, he, he's everything plus some, he's just so, um, you know, he, he's talk about centered and spiritual. This man walks his talk. You know, he really, he really has a sense of, like you said, the human condition. But beyond that, he has a real basis of spirituality. And part of that is his humor. Because yes. part of the human condition is to laugh. And, you know, I've asked him, I said, what do you, what do you attribute your endurance to? And he said, I surrounded myself with the funniest people in the world. And I laughed so much in my life that it healed me. So, yeah. you know, yes. I think that's, I think those are wise words, um, wise words and a wise uh, philosophy in life that we all mm. should listen to. This is a man who knows his stuff. And he's also been the type of person that like his, his, his tenacity and persistence to do what he did with his shows. And then even after with his, you know, advocacy, political advocacy, I mean, he, he's, he's a dynamo. Like he's, he's, He's a, an energy that like not everybody comes into this world with the energy that Norman Lear has. Let me put yeah. it that way. Yeah. And he's just so kind. He, he came to Sedona to do an evening with Norman Lear at the Sedona Performing Arts Center for um, uh, a, a, an event that I was producing. And he came into town and Mackenzie came out also. And she and I moderated the evening. And it was just so incredible to sit back and just talk about his life and to take questions from the audience. And, you know, he's just so loved by all of us. I mean, I, I can't brag enough about 
the great Norman Lear. He's this this world was definitely given a gift by Norman being born. Absolutely. I second that, my friend. Uh, what are some other exciting things that you're doing in addition to the travel series that, uh, of course, the autograph show, all of that coming up to the love boat yeah. the reunion one day right. at a time. Any other things? Have you thought of writing a memoir? You know, I've asked, I've been asked that so often because I, I share so times. much of, I share so much of my life on social that people are always saying, Oh my gosh, like, you know, you should write them. You should write a book. Um, I, I, I haven't really ever thought about sitting down to do that. That's a, it's a big undertaking, but someday maybe, but I have thought about doing it as a one man show where I could actually perform and tell some stories and show some pictures and do it in that form. Um, which I think would be a lot more fun. I'm more motivated to maybe put energy into doing it that way. So we'll see. I don't know. That's certainly something that can come up, but right now I'm, I'm jam packed with just the commitments I have. But yeah. Like I said, Johnny and I, Johnny and I always have fun ideas to tossing around and it's a new chapter of my life. So I'm also leaving balance and time for this relationship too. You know, I think that's really important in life is to, you know, because I know my workaholism is a thing mm -hmm. that I try not to always just take on another project, take on another project. Those boundaries we were talking about yes. are, are what I'm trying to do here in this new chapter of my life where I could allow myself to be and give myself space to be. And part of that is being in this relationship too. You know, I, I just love that experience of having you know, a healthy home life. So, so I'm trying to put healthy boundaries to not saying yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> is it amazing how our conversation, which is, I don't call these interviews, I call these conversations, uh, has gone full circle. Yeah. Kind of like we, we, we started in this vein, you know, talking about this and has come full circle in this way and i think it's absolutely beautiful you're loving the ride and you're still discovering who glenn is along the way which is a beautiful experience that not everybody has an opportunity to experience like me going into death valley that a lot of people said you know jim that was a gift a lot of people don't get that opportunity to have that self-exploration by being alone in a rental car in death valley it was a blessing and a gift you were given and uh, I think you're very aware of the gifts. Life is a little bit more centered maybe for you. And, you know, with all the wonderful things that have happened that, you know, you wouldn't probably trade still, uh, you're in a different point and spot in your life that is uh, at a deeper level and, and extra meaningful. Not that it wasn't before. It was definitely that. But extra meaningful as you continue to go forward, you just really soaking it all up in a beautiful way, huh? Yeah. I mean, that's what life's all about. You know, I, it's so interesting because so much of the, the work that I've done over the last, you know, two years since we've spoken is about staying in the moment. You know, I know we've talked about this too, especially the first time I was on the show because really the moment's all we have. So I try not to get too ahead of myself. And then I also try not to look in the rearview mirror very often. So it's that fine balance of, um, appreciating that which is right here, right now. And it's all we ever need. It's all we ever need. We have right here in this moment. We can't look at what we don't have. We can't what we want. Like all of that is just thoughts in our head that um, confuse what life is because everything that's precious is literally right here, right now. So on the gym master show live. <laughs> on the gym, exactly. <laughs> You fed the line. I grabbed it. But it's so true. It really is. You know, sometimes we're always chasing the rainbow all the time and we forget that, uh, hey, it's not so bad right now. You know what I mean? It's not right. so bad right now. So just soak it up and breathe it and and pay it forward, which I know you love to do. Uh, Merlin's watching in Canada and she says, I wish you the best with the endeavors that you choose. Love it. Really, really nice. And of course, Dwight is here. Glenn has a special gift of love and happiness. And that is why he is a dear, fabulous friend and a pal. Uh, and John is here. We welcome anybody that's new. This has been so much fun to watch 
Glenn, you're such an inspiration. Thank you for joining us, John. Really cool having you here on the show. I would say anybody that's uh, watching our series, you know, we have about almost 650 episodes of this series available to binge watch on our uh, YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, gang. We would love that. And uh, click the notification bell so you never miss any of the episodes. And also, Give it a like if you loved this conversation with our buddy, Glenn Scarpelli. Absolutely. Give it a uh, hearty thumbs up, like on our YouTube channel. and leave a comment on the YouTube channel as well. This was absolutely epic as I knew it would be, Glenn. It always is when we get together. It's as if, you know, we've known each other. It's as if we lived across the street from each other. Yeah, true. <laughs> Some of the, if you really think about the things that we talked about from from childhood and family and, and just empathy and inspiration and careers. And, you know, we both work in the broadcast medium television and uh, we love it, the craziness of it all, but we still, we still love it. And uh, we went in so many different directions that I think was really rich and really connecting for us. And obviously for all the loveities that are watching around the world, we, uh, we love that. Kathleen's a dear friend of mine as well. And I know she she loves your work. You're a blessing. I know she was all excited here. And uh, you're the most amazing guy ever. Paisan coming in from Paisan, Jersey. Paisan, Frank. Love That's from so Jersey. Great. Another amazing show. Thank you, Jim and Glad. Anne in Southern California, you're very welcome. Jane watching in Sweden. Thanks, Glenn, for being here. Thanks, Jim. It is our pleasure. Uh, Nikki is here. Yes, an upper show for sure. Bless your plans, Glenn. I love that. Bless your plans. Thank Isn't that you. really nice? Really That's cool. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Sherry Larson's in Kansas. Thank you, Glenn, for being here. You're fantastic. Hilarious. What a beautiful heart you have. And uh, this has been so much fun to watch. It's such an inspiration. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Maureen says, keep your eyes on the future, but don't be afraid to look back. Your past has brought you to where you are today. You're an amazing Human Glenn, this has been such a load of fun. Absolutely, Maureen. Glenn and I knew it would be. If you didn't see the first episode he was on, that was hilarious too. And I said, hey, you want to hop back on? And Glenn said, absolutely. Let's make it happen. And here he is. Great show. So much fun from Julie. Dwight, of course. Another fun, great interview. Glenn and Jim, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to hear from you, Glenn. I love you so much. Mary in Florida, Pine Island, Florida. This was such a fun show. Thanks, Glenn and Jim. You are Mary. Um, I know Mary Bishop. She writes Paco. to me a lot. Mary's wonderful, isn't she? Yes. For real love it is. Great stuff. Thank you, Glenn, for being here. Love you from Minnesota. Denise. Denise. Great to see you, Denise. Yeah, so I love this merge of the fans with our loveties. That's a beautiful way to do it. Somebody else, too, that's back with us, Mr. George Burns. Nice. <laughs> Did you ever work with him? Never. Never had I the wish. chance, huh? No, I met him once, but I he never did. worked with him. Yeah. yeah. Cool yeah. guy. He played God, of course, as we know. You are the best, my friend. I really appreciate all this time, all the wit and wisdom, being so open and so authentic. Uh, truly a levity, but you were already dubbed that uh, a while back. So yeah. uh, levity times too. I hope the show met whatever expectations it had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I and everybody watching did with you, my Definitely. friend. Definitely. Oh my gosh. I love it all the time, Jim. Thank you so <laughs> much for inviting me back. And I'm just so proud of you and everything you've accomplished with the show. It's unbelievable. Well, we'll keep that porch light on your, uh, for you, my friend. You're amazing. You Best of luck with everything. Continue uh, blessings and joy in your life. And uh, I look forward to welcoming you back real soon, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. You're the best. Bye, Glenn. everybody. Thank you, you. You take care, all right? All right. You too. Bye, everybody. Love it all. Love it all. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. Glenn Scarpelli on the Gym Master Show Live. Soraya says, Glenn, you are awesome. Absolutely. You guys are terrific. Nice, nice stuff. Thanks for all the great comments as well. And uh, we knew you'd enjoy this episode. And uh, we appreciate Glenn for joining us live and direct, not from Sedona. He was in Glendale, California. And if you missed any of this episode, well, definitely look for it in the archives. We archive all of the episodes on the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. Really cool stuff. Hey, I want to let you know uh, as well 
the amazing guests that are coming up. Now, if you didn't see the episode when Marion Ross was on the show, she was epic. We had a phenomenal conversation. This Saturday, her son, who's an extraordinary impressionist, comedian, voice artist. Yes, he is Jim Meskimen. He's going to be with us on Saturday night. But coming up tomorrow, she's been in Cinderella. She's been on Broadway. She was in Avenue Q and so much more. And Harada is with us, Broadway TV, film, actress, and singer. Really, really fantastic. She's going to be with us tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And daytime soap star. Yes, she's been on the edge of night and guiding light and you name it. Marianne Alda is with us. And she's been on some of your favorite TV shows as well. She is going to be with us. She's also a noted speaker as much as she is a uh, prolific television actress and daytime soap star for years on some of your favorite soap operas. She's here on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Joyce Boulefant, actress and television legend extraordinaire, author of the book, My Four Hollywood Husbands. Yes, she's here on Thursday. That's going to be terrific. So just some of the guests that are coming through the Jim Masters show live. You know who's coming on Sunday? Cousins Gibb. Yes, they are. Well, Nick is the son of Maurice Gibb. Yes, of the Bee Gees. And Deborah is the cousin. They are both cousins and they have their own musical group, singers, songwriters, extraordinaire, Cousins Gibb, family members of the Original Bee Gees are with us on Sunday at a special time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. in London, United Kingdom, Scotland, Great Britain, all of it, as well as in Ireland. So check that out. Yes, the Cousins Give are with us on Sunday. That's going to be amazing. It's going to be really, really cool. A lot of great shows, a lot of great people coming up. If you didn't see the episode with the amazing Kreskin, check that out. Or Karen Grassley from uh, Karen Grassley from Little House on the Prairie. She was with us as well. We thank our buddy Glenn Scarpelli for joining us once again here on the Jim Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series, where we're bringing back the lost art of conversation, and we're doing it in style with and for all of you. Hope you guys enjoyed yourself. Thanks for all these great comments and everything else. Another great show. Thank you, Mary, and Archive for tomorrow. That's why those archives are there. Thank you, Jim and Glenn, Kathleen Walker. My pleasure. And everybody else, you guys are the best. Thanks for all these great comments. We love it. From Jersey. Jersey's in the house. Thank you for being here as well. And don't forget, guys, anybody that's new, or if you haven't yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, give it some lovity or Jameis lovity. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed this episode and leave a comment for us on the YouTube channel. Uh, we don't just say that randomly. That really helps us get the word out and uh, so much more. Thanks for being with us, Denise. We really appreciate it. We love having you here as well. Great to see you and, uh, and everybody. A lot of great uh, folks who've been chiming in. You're very welcome, Mary. You're very welcome, Dwight and Julie and everybody watching, whether you're a regular viewer, one of our lovely squad members, or you're brand new. We thank you very, very much for your time, your attention, and for being with us. We don't do rush interviews. We have conversations on the Jim Master Show Live. Neat show, Jim. Thank you, Nikki. I appreciate that. You guys want to help support us? There's a little uh, heart button on our YouTube channel. It says thanks. Feel free to do that. Some of you have been doing that. That helps support the series. Don't forget the thumbs up, like on the uh, channel underneath this episode on YouTube, and also leave a comment for us. We would love that. Thank you, Jane, watching in Sweden. Maureen says, Jim, you knocked this one out of the park. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. The pleasure is all mine. Maureen, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks for all the participation, gang. We tried to get as many comments as we could. Hopefully we got to quite a few of them. There's there's so many of them, but um, 
Thank you, Jim, for another fantastic evening. Good night, everyone. Sweet dreams to all. Love and hugs from Sherry Larson in Kansas, USA. Love it. We've heard from all around the world today, too. If you missed uh, having an opportunity to chat with us live and chat with all of these great comments, leave a comment for us on our YouTube channel. We're very responsive there as well. You guys are the best. Thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. We love all of you and uh, keep spreading the word about our show. This is the Jim Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series, bringing back the Lost Art of Conversation with guests that come in from all walks of life, celebrity friends, and so much more. We always have a good time and we have the good time with all of you, all of you. George Burns, George Burns is always by my side. He's right here. There's Georgie. There's your George Burns gang. Because <laughs> Nikki asks, where did George Burns go? He is right here. Thank you very much, Anne, as well, and everybody. Smile some Nikki. We got we we have the best crowd, the best viewers, the best uh, levities that are out there right here on the Gym Masters show live. Some amazing guests again that are coming up. Uh, on the show. And again, there are hundreds and hundreds more that have come through here. If you haven't had an opportunity, these are all the ones that are coming up. But if you haven't had a chance to see some of our past episodes, check them out. They're all archived on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. All right, we're going to scoot out, gang. We love having you with us. What a great party here on the Jim Masters Show Live with Glenn Scarpelli and with you, 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 and you and yours truly. Be well, take care. We don't say goodbye here. We just say cheers. Sayonara, shalom, uh, moy loop, slancha, avida zain. <laughs> take care, be well, and uh, we'll see you again on the next episode. I'll be waiting here right here for you in this host chair. Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time on the Jim Masters Show Live. Take care, love one another, be good to one another, and cheers. <laughs> <laughs>